Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Little Hell's Midweek Meeting. If you are from another church and you're watching, welcome to you also. And uh, My name is John Erdley. I'm one of the elders at Little Hill Church, and we're going to be looking into God's Word this evening from John chapter 13. If you have a Bible, then do find that. But before we read God's Word together, let's pray and ask his blessing. Our Father, we do thank you for your word this evening, and we pray as we read it together and as we look into it, that you, by your Holy Spirit, might make its teaching plain and clear to us, and that you might help us to respond in faith and in obedience. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read then the passage for our study this evening from John 13. We're going to just read the first 20 verses and look into those together. So John 13 and verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was not, sorry, he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are, cl are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. The scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. What I'd like us to do this evening is to think about the love the Lord Jesus Christ has for his people. What better subject could we have on this eve, just before Good Friday, this Easter weekend, and to remember the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and what, particularly in the midst of this crisis that we're going through at the moment, what could be better than to think about how loved we are as God's people. I'm speaking, I imagine, largely this evening to those watching who are believers. And it's our great encouragement, isn't it, to think about the love that God has for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to do this evening. I want to draw your attention to 
in these words, particularly to uh, the first verse and words at the end of the first verse. Let me read them to you again. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It's those words. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, people's last words are very meaningful and significant. We're interested in what people said before the end of their days. And what could be more significant and meaningful to us than the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what we have before us here in this chapter. In fact, the five chapters, chapter 13 through to 17, we have what's often called the upper room discourse, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples before he goes to Gethsemane and then to the cross. And they are words of love. The Lord Jesus Christ is preparing his disciples for what's to happen. He's preparing them for his death the next day. Verse 1, the words we're focusing upon, are a fitting heading to this section of these words of love. And what I'd like us to do as we look at these uh, words from the end of verse 1, John 13, is to think of three things. First of all, Jesus loves his own. Jesus loves his own. Secondly, Jesus loves them always. And thirdly, sorry, secondly, Jesus loves them now. And thirdly, Jesus loves them always. So firstly, Jesus loves his own. It's a lovely phrase, isn't it, for us as Christians to be his own, Jesus' own people. Not everybody in this world can say that, but we as Christians can. We belong to Jesus. Now Jesus, our Lord Jesus, owns everything. He doesn't have to fight for ownership of things. I think of uh, sometimes of that scene from the Disney Pixar film Finding Nemo. I don't know if you've seen that film, but in it there's a, a short scene, very humorous scene, where there are some seagulls and they're fighting over morsels of food, over fish. And as they do, they're saying, as seagulls, you might imagine in a Disney way, would say, mine, mine, mine. They're fighting after those bits of food. Jesus doesn't have to fight for the things of this world as people often do, all things belong to him. There's a wonderful quotation from Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian and statesman. Let me read it to you. You may have heard it before. He said this, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. All things belong to him. But we as Christian people belong to him in a different sense from anything else he's made. We are his, the objects of his divine love in a way that nothing else is. Yes, of course, he loves all creation. But he loves us in a different way from the way he loves insects and even archangels. He loves his people in a wonderful way. It's a wonderful privilege to be able to say, isn't it, this evening as... Believers, in the words of the Song of Songs, I am his and he is mine. We belong to him. And not everybody can say that. Don Carson, the theologian, points out that in John chapter 3, that most famous verse, John 3, 16, speaking about the lost, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. John Carson points out that the love there is a love that is meant to draw people out of the world, to make them into this new entity, the body of Christ he loves, set apart from the world. The Bible makes clear a distinction between people, those who are his own, objects of his divine love, and those who are in the world, those who are at enmity with God, those who don't belong to Jesus in the way that believing people do. And 40 times in these chapters, these five chapters, this phrase, the world is used to designate those who are outside of this love of God's own people. 
those who are under his wrath. And we mustn't blur the distinction. We must make clear to people. And if you're one of them listening in and you can't say I'm his own, I am a believer, you're in a very dangerous position. You have enmity with God and you're under his wrath. And you must come. You must come to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him if you are to belong to his people and be one of his own and an object of his love. Which are you this evening? Most of us, I imagine, are those who can say we are his own. A wonderful thing to be one of Jesus' own people, given to him by the Father. As he prays in, at the end of this section, John 17, he speaks of how we've been given to him by the Father. We're chosen, and given to the Son by the Father, purchased by his blood, his precious blood. Whose blood could be more precious than his and it's been given for us, as we'll be thinking again this Easter, purchased by his precious blood, as Peter calls it, and made members of his body. We are his own. We belong to him. Jesus loves his own. But then secondly, from this first verse, we read, having loved his own who were in the world. Jesus loves his own. <clears throat> he loves them now. He loves them now. He loves us now while we're in this world. Here in this upper room, he is speaking to his disciples then. And he's speaking to them despite their failings. What a bunch they were. What a raggle-taggle bunch of imperfections they were. And yet Jesus loved them still. He loved them despite their boasting, their pride. He loved them dis despite their ignorance and their faithlessness so often. How slow they were to learn from him and yet how patiently and lovingly he bore with them and taught them. And he loved them despite the context. Did you notice the context here in this verse? Before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. Just think of what was must have been on his mind. He knew what was to come for him. He was to face the next day the agonies of the cross. We see him at times when this pressed in upon him, shrinking back from it, praying in the garden when these things were pressing in upon him, that his hour, it might, the cup might pass from him. He knew the hour had come to bear the wrath of God against our sins in his body on the tree. He knew all of that was to come. He knew the shameful abandonment of the, the disciples who were about to be scattered and to run away despite their protestations that they would stick by him. He knew he would be denied and knowing all of this, his love was constant. And isn't that how he is with us? What a raggle-taggle bunch of imperfections we are to his people today. And yet Jesus loves us now while we are what we are and while we're in this world he knows what this world is like this world of trouble that we must go through until we come to him he knows all about this time we're in now this world full of coronavirus he knows what we must go through what he's doing in these verses is preparing the disciples for what would come he tells them about the betrayer the traitor judas he tells peter warns him about his threefold denial. He comforts them in these chapters to follow about the coming of the Holy Spirit to be their helper and comforter, to give them power to lead them into all truth. And in his great high priestly prayer in chapter 17, he, he speaks so lovingly of his disciples and what he wants for them. He loved his disciples then and he loves us now despite what we are and knowing all we must go through knowing this world he prays in john 17 15 not that we be taken out of this world that we would be kept from the evil one how amazing that our jesus should love us jesus loves his own and jesus loves them now he loves us now and then finally, Jesus loves them always. Jesus loves his own. He loves them always. This verse one again, he loved them to the end. Now there's a double meaning 
in that phrase, to the end. The end could also mean not just the end of his life, but to the uttermost. Jesus loved his disciples, he loves us, to the fullest extent. Both translations of these words point to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to come the next day. Because John, in John chapter 15 verse 13, points out, Greater love has no one than this, that someone should lay down his life for his friends. That's the greatest of loves. That's the love of the cross that was to come for the Lord Jesus. He loves us to the end. He loved his disciples to the fullest extent, to the love, to the death of his cross. And then we have this symbolic uh, foot washing in this section that we read. And there are three things, at least three things, three key things that this foot washing incident show to us. And they concern, again, the love of the Lord Jesus. The first thing is found in verse 8. It centres upon the cleansing of the blood of Christ shed on the cross. Let me read verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. We must be cleansed. We must be washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we are by faith in him, washed and made clean, we are completely clean, as we're told here. Verse 10, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. The cleansing of the blood of Christ gives us an eternal cleansing, a justification that enables us to stand before God one day in his presence for all eternity. We are eternally justified when we are cleansed by the blood of Christ once and for all. That's the first a purpose of the teaching and the, the symbolic act of the Lord Jesus Christ to speak of the cleansing in his blood. But there's a secondary point here where Peter objects and Jesus then teaches us about our need for progressive sanctification because we're not yet perfect in heaven. We still sin and Jesus has made provision by his blood for our daily forgiveness and for the relief of the guilt of our daily sin to give us peace again through forgiveness. It's what John writes in his letter about this as well. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus in his love has made provision for our daily dirtying, we might say, of our feet in this world that these words speak of here. A person who has been completely cleansed and it doesn't need to wash. We don't need that once for all cleansing in the blood of Christ. But we need our acts and words and deeds of sin to be forgiven every day. And Jesus makes provision for that. But this foot washing has a third lesson as well, doesn't it? It speaks of the example of the Lord Jesus Christ we are to follow. Jesus lovingly has given us work to do. And what a privilege we can follow in his footsteps to be his humble servants like him, to wash each other's feet. Not in reality, not giving us a right here, today, or on Monday, Thursday, as it's sometimes called, some church dignitaries will, will enact this foot washing, washing the feet of the poor. But it's not that which is being set up here for us. But an everyday washing, metaphorically, of each other's feet, humbling ourselves like our master to serve one another in love. And this foot washing is what is spoken of here also, the example we are to follow. So then, as we come to this Easter time, let's remember the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for his people. It's an endless love. Jesus loves us always. A love that takes us beyond the cross, through his resurrection, his ascension, into heaven with him. Jesus, in that high priestly prayer in John 17, 24 to 26, prays to the Father that we might share his glory and know the love of Father and Son eternally. That's 
the endless love of our Saviour. Jesus loves his own. Jesus loves them now. And Jesus loves them always. How wonderful to be loved by him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your everlasting love. We thank you you loved us before this world was made as your people. We thank you you gave us your Son and he gave his life to be our Saviour. We thank you that love is endless and will take us through our death into glory. Or if the Lord returns first, we will be raised up to be with him and with you forever in that glorious world of love in your presence. Father, we thank you for these things. Bless us in them, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Little Hillites, we just have time now if you want to join in the hand clapping with others to give thanks for those who are serving us so well at this time. And then even time perhaps to get yourself a cup of tea and be ready at 7.15 for our time of prayer together. I shall see you then.